So we're trying something a little bit new this week at, at Healthy Gamer. Um, so a lot of people, like thousands of people, have expressed interest or curiosity about becoming coaches. Um, I also know that a ton of people in our community are really interested in like understanding motivation. So uh, part of what we're going to be doing today is teaching our coaches like how to think about goal setting and motivation. We're going to be explaining some principles of psychology and neuroscience and things like that. And I think actually it can be useful for people in our community to kind of like learn this stuff on their own. Um, a one or two interesting kind of points to remember. The first is that this is not really geared towards a DIY perspective, right? So this is a training that we do for our coaches so that they can help other people do it. So um, that perspective may be a little bit different. So a lot of people had questions yesterday about like, can I do this myself? How do I do this by myself? Um, there are certainly ways of doing that, but that's not quite the focus. So we're still going to share all the principles because we think those are useful. But um, especially today, for example, we're going to share some of the mechanisms through which behavioral change happens in a neuroscience, from a neuroscience perspective. And so some of those mechanisms are specifically... Uh, they specifically inform how we've designed our coaching program. So our coaching program is sort of designed to take advantage of some of these things, which it may be harder for you to implement kind of on your own, but you can absolutely sort of still benefit from them. Now we get to the four types of intent or the four dimensions of intent. So when, when someone says, I have a goal, I, what are the four things that could be driving this person? Like, why do people pick goals? Like outside pressure, like, like family or a society or something. Okay. So pressure. Excellent. Society, family. What else? Values. Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, it's like something they care about. Okay. So when someone feels pressured, and they say a goal, they, they're saying that I have to accomplish this goal. What is the verb that they use? I know it's kind of a weird. Need. Okay, good. Excellent. What else do they say? Should. Absolutely. Okay. So what else goes into, you know, why someone does something? It's their duty. Okay. So duty. So what do they, what's the word that they use there? So care about is a good example of a value. What's the word Resp that they use? Responsibility? Yep. Absolutely. Right? Uh, or obligation. So do you guys see how like these are different things? What I, what I should do is different from, and we'll get to should and an obligation in a second, because you could say that your duty is what you should do. Um, and I'd say the key, well, let's just talk about it now. So I think the big difference is like the duty is like owed to someone else. And there are all kinds of things that you should do that you don't owe to someone else. Does that make sense? Like I should eat healthier, but that's not like a duty. It's just, I should eat healthier because society, you know, judges me because of my body type. And if I don't want to be poorly judged by society or my family makes fun of me for being like overweight or underweight or whatever, like that's, that's a should, but it's not something that I owe someone. So you can use the word should for duty, but this is exactly the point of like having this discussion because these are actually different internal drives that share the same language. And so when people use unsophisticated language, they don't diagnose the problem correctly. Like I'm sick. So as a doctor, it's like sick with what? right? Like there isn't medicine for sickness. There, there are treatments for diseases and we need specificity of our language to figure out where the problem is so that we can fix it. There's one big bucket that we're missing. Wants. Desire or wants. Yeah, perfect. Desires, right? This has nothing to do with duty or obligation. It's like sometimes, you know, Dr. K just needs a hot dog. Like that has nothing to do with, you know, what I should be eating or, or values or anything like that. It's just like, I smell, you know, there's some Korean corn dog place that opened up sort of near where I live. There's always a line out the door. I don't actually like really want to eat it, but sometimes when I walk by, I get curious and I smell it. And, and so that's, you know, there are desires, right? I want to play league because I want to school some noobs. So if we kind of look at these, 
one of the things that I, I, I kind of notice is that some of these result in a loss for me. Like I have to give something up. And some of these result in a gain. And then the other kind of dimension is that some of these lead to like external... Um, what's the term I want to use here? Um, what's, I figured out a good term. Yeah, so external reward and internal reward. Okay. So where do y'all think desires go? Which quadrant would you put them in? When I satisfy my desires, do I gain something or do I lose something? Gain. Absolutely. And do I gain an internal reward or an external reward? External. Yeah, so this is where desires go. So this is going to be kind of weird, but like I define external reward as something that is, includes a bodily satisfaction, right? It's like some kind of pleasure. So let's think a little bit about the things that I should do. Like my family wants to become a doctor. Where does that go? Is that a gain or a loss for me? It's a loss. Yeah, it's kind of weird. So you got you to run with my system here, okay? It's not, this isn't science. So there's no Ohm's law for this. This is Dr. K's impression. Like I have to give something up. That's the way I kind of think about a loss, right? So I have to give up potentially like my own happiness. And what about internal reward or external reward? What's the advantage of doing things that I should do? It's an external reward. Absolutely, right? So I want to be a professional video gamer, but that's not a respectable profession. And I can't really hold my head up high while I'm grinding like a professional video game. But if I'm a doctor and I put that on my Tinder profile, that comes with a lot of prestige, even though I hate myself on the inside because, you know, I did something that I don't really want to do for the wrong reasons. So shoulds go here. Where do values go? Bottom right. Absolutely. So walk me through that. Um, you're gaining something because you're doing it because you value it. And it's also internal to yourself as opposed to a hot dog. Yeah, right. So like when I when I do things that I care about, I usually get something out of it. Right. So like if uh, like let's say that I, you know, I care about my children, so I'm going to take care of them when they're sick. Actually, that may be a obligation. We'll get get to that in a second. But generally speaking, things that you care about in my experience tend to come to um tend to come with some kind of gain, like you get some sort of like personal satisfaction out of it. And like the reward that you gain is not something that is shown to the the external world. There's no prestige with it. There may not necessarily be like bodily enjoyment with it. So like a good example of this is let's say that I enjoy hiking and I climb to the top of a mountain. I, I'm not it's like generally speaking, like, does it cost me something? Sure. Like it requires effort, right? So doing things that you care about sometimes require effort, but it like feels good on the inside and you get to the top and there's like a view and like you feel kind of like amazing. So that's something like doing things that you care about. And so then our last bucket is duty kind of goes up here. And so if we think about duty, duty usually involves sacrifice, right? So it's like a loss. It's not something that necessarily like I want to do for my sake. It's an obligation or something that I owe. So it like costs me something, but it's very satisfying to do. So for example, taking care of my kids when they're sick, like overnight, um, is something that feels like internally satisfying as a parent, because like, I know I'm being a good parent. It's not something that I'm posting on social media or anything that I'm going to like get prestige or enjoyment out of. And it actually it costs me something, right? Cause I have to stay up all night and like try to take care of them and, and all that kind of good stuff. So duty kind of goes up here. Does that make sense? So let me ask y'all, when people kind of come to you and they, they come up with goals and they say like, oh, I have these goals, what quadrant, what quadrant or quadrants do you think the average client that y'all deal with is operating from? Shoulds or desires? What do y'all think about that? Agree with, is that Alan? Yeah, I would say shoulds. Right? So, so we've got two votes for shoulds, one vote for desire. What about shoulds. the rest of y'all? Yeah. 
Okay. I think shoulds because if someone had a desire, they would be able to do it without a coach. Okay. So when you think about their lives and the behaviors that they engage in, what um, what do you think actually drives them and like what shapes their behavior? Eli. So not oh just the things Could you that ask they, me the question again? Yeah. So you said that they come to coaching and they have already satisfied their desires. What they need help with is the shoulds. Well, very well said. So I'm going to ask you to dig a little bit deeper. And for the things that like most of what they actually do, the behaviors that your clients engage in, what do you think is the driving force for what they're able to, what they're doing without you? Gotcha. Um, I'd say a lot of times desires, like if you take your corn dog example, most people don't need a coach to go buy a corn dog. They have enough motiv motivation, if you will, by themselves to go do that. Okay. And so like, I know this, this so this is going to be kind of, actually, I forget the leading question. So well said. So I completely agree. So in my experience, most people operate from the left side of the quadrant and operating from the left side of the quadrant can sometimes make people happy. But generally speaking, like what we're talking about is a, living a life of external reward. And then the other thing that tends to happen is like when you're living a life of external reward and it's kind of like loss oriented, like the loss of the should, if, if you're living a life of external reward, you can't like afford that loss. I don't know how else to put it, right? So what I'd say is that when people actually move from this quadrant to this quadrant or this quadrant to this quadrant or this quadrant to this quadrant, this is when their motivation starts to move in a positive direction. They feel good about themselves and they take control of their lives. What do y'all think about that? That's a, that's a hypothesis or assertion that I'm putting forward, which y'all can agree or disagree with. Definitely agree. Right? So this is something that we also see in addiction psychiatry. So in addiction psychiatry, people have a powerful biological driver that is forcing them to use a substance, right? So biology doesn't even enter this, like this equation. When you have biology entering it, what we, we kind of go more towards is like, I'd say that biology is sort of maybe in desires, right? Because that's like reward circuitry and dopamine and stuff like that. So this also maybe is like where YouTube and gaming and stuff live. And so when it, when it comes to helping someone overcome an addiction, like literally the process that we try to do, there's a whole system of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is sort of based on, it's another one of these like novel therapies that takes a sprinkling of Eastern wisdom and then packages it up in a Western way and calls itself something new. Some interesting cultural appropriation going on there. So ACT is an evidence-based treatment for, um, uh, is an evidence-based treatment for addictions. And what the goal of ACT is, is it sort of says that the more that you move people into this quadrant, the easier it is to overcome addictions. And that's been my experience as well. Like, like people have to have a clear reason to make the sacrifice, right? Like they have to make the sacrifice or give up the external reward. And there has to be something I want you all to understand this. Like anytime we're talking about motivation, right? There's a pro and a con in someone's brain. There's a calculation that's going on constantly. Should I do this thing or should I not do this thing? Should I eat the hot dog or should I not eat the hot dog? And what keeps people stuck is essentially like a conflict between two of these quadrants. So I should do this, but I want to do this. And then we feel paralyzed. It's my duty to do this, but I want to do this, right? I want to do this, but this is what I care about. I actually do genuinely care about like being healthy. And I hate the way that I feel when I like drink too much. At the same time, I want to get absolutely hammered and go party and have fun with my friends. And so what keeps people stuck is actually like conflicts between these two, uh, these different quadrants. Does that make sense? So as a coach, what our goal is, is to help people essentially move from this side over here. And how do y'all think we do that? What's our methodology? awareness and understanding of what's going on absolutely in their mind absolutely that's that's the key thing awareness and understanding okay and that may sound kind of weird because like what how does awareness and understanding like actually create 
How does that drive behavior? Like once you clarify this stuff for people, like how does that help them? Because when you can see like the driving forces behind these things, it's much easier to understand them and then shift around your own personal values for your choices. Absolutely. Right. So I know it sounds kind of weird, but like, you know, like when, when our clients come in and they say like, oh, I have this goal and I should do it. So like, let's use the example of like the student who doesn't feel like studying. Right. So like, what is the student who doesn't feel like studying? Like, what do they say to you? Like what language I should do they study? Do? Absolutely. Right. And then you ask them what makes it hard. Uh, like, why don't you study? And what do they say? I don't want to. There you go. There it is, right? It's that simple. So they're stuck right here. And so like the way that you help that client, like it is by sort of clarifying like their values, right? Like, so this is where, you know, when I work with clients who are like that, it's sort of thinking about, okay, like, what do you actually care about? Why are you actually in college? You know, why did you go here? Is it to fulfill a societal obligation? Is that why you went to college? Or is there something genuinely that you can come to appreciate about college? Is there anything that we can figure out here that aligns with what you actually care about? Because if you can help that person uncover what, what about college aligns with them, and that could even be duty. You could even like come to the revelation. I've had students do this who sort of say that like, okay, my parents have supported me. They're paying for my college I owe them like some degree of like work, right? Because they're paying for me, so I should do this. And then what? And then it's it's not like a vague should. It actually, even though they use the word should, it crosses over into duty, and then we see a positive behavioral change. Once you align studying with their values, we see a positive behavioral change. Because then, even if you're if you're giving something up, even if there's a loss involved, if it kind of like if you're giving something up, but you can make that class your own, like if you kind of say, okay, well. I'm in college, I'm studying finance, but I really care about philosophy. And what I'm going to do is like minor in philosophy. And you sort of help them sort of uncover, you know, some plan to help them act in a way that's aligned with their values. And you'll see positive behavioral change. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So the second thing, so the key takeaway here is that, you know, as a coach, what you want to do is clarify, like, what is driving this person? Clarify their intent. And as you clarify their, their intent, you can start to ask them questions that sort of help them understand, like, what is on this side of the equation? And how do we get from, like, this side of the equation to this side of the equation? How do we get and what's the conflict that they face? And the cool thing about human beings is once you bring a subconscious conflict to the surface in a conscious manner, it tends to move towards the right direction. Okay, so that those are the four types of intent. Any questions before we move on? Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do <coughs> is talk about raising the, uh, uh, the awareness of negative. So this is a big problem that a lot of people who set goals and like have intent, you know, these kind of in intent problems have, which is that they don't really appreciate the negative. So when someone talks about a goal, like, and they say like, okay, my goal is to study every day. Like what kind of, you know, is that like a positive thing in their mind or a negative thing in their mind? When people think about like meeting their goals, so what is like the emotional energy behind that? What's the valence there? Some part of it is like resentment or the situation they're in. Ah, okay. <laughs> Very good. Is that conscious or unconscious? What do y'all think? I would say unconscious. Yeah, I mean, they may be somewhat conscious of it, but for the most part, it's unconscious, right? So when I think about losing weight, is that idea filled with resentment or like, or what? Right? When I think about getting a 4.0 GPA, like, is the primary emotion that I feel when I think about that resentment? What's the primary emotion that people feel when they, they kind of think about fulfilling their goals? Some kind of excitement. Yeah. So it's positive in nature, right? So it's like exciting, achievement, pride. Right? So this is interesting. So like 
when someone is kind of thinking about their goals in a very positive manner, um, you know, you're, I'm going to post it on social media. Like I'm going to advertise, I'm going to get into Harvard and I'm going to like buy a Harvard hoodie and a Harvard hat and then a Harvard bumper sticker. And then everyone's going to know I went to Harvard. It's going to be great. So what happens when they sort of have all of these like positive, like expectations or ideas of achieving their goals and they set out to actually like achieve their goals? Doesn't usually Existence. work sustainably. Why not? Because part of their brain is sort of thought that they've already done it. And so there's less motivation to do it. And part of it is that whenever there's like an implicit judgment about what you're doing, it's like putting white gas in your car. Like it'll kind of get you going for a little while. Like you can do almost anything for a week or two. And then it's just not going to work all that well. Okay, excellent. Someone's been watching Dr. K's guide, I think. Their motivation yeah, is it's, hinged. It's, oh, sorry, Alan. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, it's pretty good. Have you have you seen it? <laughs> Steve? I was going to say their motivation is hinged on the outcome, not Absolutely. on their action. Right. So when we so when we people think about goals in a positive way, which is like sort of how we defaultly think about them, it's like it's a weird sentence to say, because like, of course, we want to achieve our goals. Like, why do we want to achieve our goals? Because of like some something positive. Duh. That's why they're my goals to begin with. But there's interesting. It's interesting because what actually happens is we create an expectation. So let's say like I think about how awesome it's going to be when I get into shape. It's going to be great. I create this expectation of how like. I'm going to be a Chad and I'm going to go to the beach and like, it's going to be like Chad city up in here. And then I go to the gym and what's my experience in the gym. It's hard. Yep. Right. I'm huffing. I'm puffing. There's shame. And after there's one people week, there who are in shape and you're not, Oh, there you go. Right. And after one week, I look at my flabby ass in the mirror and what do I see? Am I, am I Dr. Chad Thundercock now? Has, has the Not action yet. that I've taken, what is the correlation between the action that I've taken and the expectation that I have? It's fallen way short. Absolutely. And then what does that do to my motivation? Decrease. Absolutely. Right. So this is the big thing. Like when people come in and they're like, I'm fired up. Like I'm achieve this goal. I'm going to make my life what I want it to be. You know, I'm going to crush it. I'm going to make a million dollars. I'm going to get into shape. I'm going to like, it's going to be awesome. Like I'm going to do so good. I'm going to become a pro league of legends player. It's going to be awesome. And so like, it's kind of weird, but like one of the key things we can do as a coach is raise awareness of the negative. So there are a couple of important things there. The first thing that we do when we raise awareness of the negative is we fix this expectation issue because we set appropriate expectations. And the problem is that when they set inappropriate expectations and they go out and they do something and th what happens doesn't align with their expectations, it tanks their motivation and then they quit, right? And then they feel ashamed of themselves and then they feel they get the identity of a quitter. GG, get wrecked noobs game over right so this cycle happens so fast and it starts with here okay or it doesn't identity of the quitter sounds harsh so they're like all these like milder versions of this right they're like oh i'm not good at that like i'm good at being a programmer but i'm like not good at actually making video games like you know there are things that we've spent a decade training in and so we'll see this a lot in our community as well where they're like there are people who are doing pretty well in life but like when it comes to doing things that they find that they value. So there are a lot of people that can actually do the, the should column really well. We'll get these people too. And when you talk to them that they feel unhappy and you talk to them about, oh, you know, what about the things that you value? There'll be some kind of identity thing there, right? They, they'll feel like, okay, I'm not quite as talented as like other musicians. Or they'll say things like, I've already invested so much into this career that like I would feel behind if I switched now or it's too late, right? And if they start saying things like that, what is that, where, what part of the mind is that coming from? If they say I'm behind other musicians because I've spent 10 years as a programmer. That's, that's the ego. Ego. Absolutely. Right. So it, it doesn't have to look like, a, you know, a quit 
shamed, like neat kind of person, right? Like the, this stuff, this cycle manifests in people who are like very healthy and very successful. It's just the way that the mind works. So the first thing that we're going to do by raising awareness of the negative is that we're going to like deal with the idea of expectation. And as your clients learn how to expect appropriate things from their actions, it'll actually like disable this cycle and they'll be able to retain motivation. The second thing that raising awareness of the negative does is, let me think about what number two is, has to do with ambivalence. Okay, so can somebody de define ambivalence for me again? It's like you're sitting on the fence. Absolutely, right? So like on the fence. So if we kind of go back, oh, if we go back to this, like these conflicts are ambivalence. Y'all see that? This is, this is ambivalence right here. So anytime that humans have a desire to do something, or I mean, I'm using the word desire loosely here. Anytime that a human wants to do something, if they don't do it, there's something that's getting in the way. And so the other thing that happens with our clients is like they think about, you know, what they want to accomplish, but they don't really appreciate what keeps them from accomplishing it. So this is kind of weird, but like, a lot of people in, in the digital generation, they say that they lack motivation. They don't lack motivation. They actually have a ton of motivation. And I want you guys to think about this. It's going to sound kind of weird. If I play a video, if I wake up and I, let's say like I'm a video game addict, right? And I watch video, I play video games all day long and my life is falling apart. And I describe myself as unmotivated. What do y'all think about that? Am I unmotivated? No. Why do you say no, David? You're just really motivated to play video games. Absolutely, right? So I want you guys to really appreciate this. If playing video games is destroying every dimension of my life, it's screwing up my relationships, it's screwing up my health, it's screwing up my professional prospects, it's screwing up my grades. For that high of a cost, I want you all to recognize that there must be a pro on the other side of that equation in order to continue that behavior. And this is the thing that no one thinks about being a video game addict is a huge pro in their mind. But it absolutely is because that's just like literally how the brain works. Human beings do not engage in like, generally speaking, negative things. We default to things that on balance benefit us. That's how we've evolved. So how do I know like how, you know, how far to hunt or what kind of territory to have? It's because on balance, the pros outweigh the cons. And that's just how evolution works. So by raising awareness of the negative, we're sort of highlighting costs. Uh, sorry, I said highly. But... So we highlight costs and then we kind of like help people understand like what is on the other side of the equation. Because the other problem with people who are unmotivated is they, they just don't understand it, right? They're like, I don't know. Every part of my life is falling apart because I'm addicted to video games. I just don't know why I can't do something about it. There's a huge blind spot in their mind. And the, high, uh, the blind spot is actually highlighting the costs. Or in a weird way for a negative behavior, it's highlighting the benefit. So in either case, it's about both sides of the fence. Okay? So th the advantage of sort of highlighting the negative or in, in some sense the pro. Like uh, the reason I'm talking about the negative is when I think about, okay, I want to become a doctor and that's the goal that I have. There's like a negative to that. There's a huge cost to that, which is why I'm not doing it. That's why I'm not engaging in the behavior. Does that make sense? So it can be positive or negative, but we're basically talking about the flip side of the coin. And the cool thing about that is once again, we have evidence-based motivational interviewing. And once you highlight the negative and you raise that ambivalence and you start working with them using the stages of change model, that's when you start to see positive change. But that has to start with awareness of the negative and working on that ambivalence. Until you can't move someone past ambivalence, you can't move someone past an internal conflict if they don't know what the internal conflict is. And eventually what you want to get to is to the point where your client is making a choice. And once they understand that they're making a choice every single day, I have a choice today to play League of Legends or take one insignificant step towards the life that I want to, 
Which one am I going to pick? And once they understand that it's going to be an insignificant step, it's going to feel insignificant. They're going to study today, but it's not going to give them a 4.0, that they'll never get a 4.0. But who do I want to be? Do I want to live a life that is in service to my values filled with external rewards? Or do I want to live a life that is in service to what I care about and is going to lead to internal reward? Once that choice becomes clear in their mind, which you're going to help them do, and we'll explain a little bit about the neuroscience of how that works, then they start making choices in the right direction, right? And also from uh, motivational interviewing, we know from numerous scientific studies that this methodology is actually effective at creating a behavioral change in the right direction. Okay? So working on ambivalence. Um, <laughs> okay. And then we get to the third uh, advantage of raising the uh, awareness of the negative, which is that, <laughs> this is kind of weird, but paradoxically, so this is going to sound kind of weird. I, I may have kind of uh, spoiled y'all already. But once the cost of a behavior increases in my mind, what does that actually do to my ability or my likelihood to engage in the behavior? It lowers it. So that's what one would think. But paradoxically, increasing cost can sometimes drive behavior. Okay? And that may sound really weird because it is. So this is where, like, we're not really sure how this works. We just know multiple instances of, like, human behavior where this is the case. So the first example is actually comes from wine tasting. Okay? So people have done studies on wine tasting. And, like, what do y'all think? So if I, if I blind a group of people like let's say expert sommeliers, which are like professional wine tasters, and I blind them to a wine, like to like, let's say I give them five bottles of wine that have various costs. What do you think happens? Do you think the sommeliers can tell which wine is like, do you think they can tell that the more expensive wine actually tastes better? No. So it's interesting because you're correct. So like people, like the interesting thing about sommeliers is they'll agree There'll be consensus about which wines are better than others. So they can rank the wines from one, two, three, four, five, but there'll be like no correlation with dollar signs. Now, they do a second experiment where they tell them they're not blinded to price. What do you think happens when uh, wine tasters are not blinded to price in terms of how they rate wines? The more expensive ones taste better. Absolutely. So the price drives the perception of quality. Okay. So this is like, so there've been scientific studies on this. And so like, like corporations use this all the time in terms of like, you know, they'll use it for sales, for example. So when I say that, oh, this, this car costs a hundred thousand dollars, but you can get it on sale for like $40,000. There's this perception of value that like is created by the cost that you pay. It's kind of bizarre. The other good example of this is there have been a lot of studies on hazing. And what effect does hazing have on someone's like value of the group they're being hazed to join? Like if I get hey, if I have to get hazed to join a frat, what happens to my perception of the value of the frat? It goes up. Absolutely. Increases value. And if we think about it, like if I tell you. Like, I'm going to tell you, hey, if you want to join this frat, it's going to fucking suck. We're going to tie you up naked. Seriously happened at, at a, you know, the university I went to when I was a freshman. Like, there was one fraternity that would tie up their pledges naked on a tree. They'd, like, tie them up onto trees. And then the people in the frat would piss on them. Make you naked, I'm going to piss on you. And it's going to be awful. What do y'all think, like, how many people do you think dropped out of hazing, like, after the, the pledge process, after being demeaned and paying this huge, humiliating cost? Not my frat, by the way. But uh, I'll say, like, none. Absolutely. So I know it's weird, okay? Like, I don't understand exactly why this happens, but as coaches, like, we sort of don't care, <laughs> Right. So what we're going to do as coaches is we're going to use psychology and neuroscience to help our clients get to where they need to go. 
And like, we're not saying we're going to haze them or anything like that, right? We don't want to do that. That's not, we're not going to be, we're going to be like authentic and compassionate. But what we can learn is that paradoxically high front loaded costs can actually incentivize behavior. And what we see this time and time and time again, right? If you tell your client, hey, like, what do you think going to the gym is like? They're going to be like, oh, I think it's going to be tough. And you guys raise awareness of the negative. You're going to be like, it may be really hard. You may feel ashamed. Okay, what what's going to happen? Like, let's think about it. How are we going to deal with that shame? Where does that shame come from? Like, how are you going to feel? And then what do they say when you actually like get them to go if you've prepped them about the negative costs? What do they say when they come back? It wasn't that bad. Absolutely. So here's the key thing. All right. What does this statement do to their motivation? How does this it statement affect whether they go tomorrow or not? It increases. Absolutely. fucking lutely Right? So this is why we want to raise awareness of the negative. There are actually multiple mechanisms that are really important about raising awareness of the negative. The first is that we deal with their expectations. We set appropriate expectations. The second is that by elevating the cost... So I don't know if y'all have this, or if y'all have ever seen this, but like we see examples of this all the time. So another good example is like, you know, parents who are like living vicariously through their children. So they've given up so much for their child. And so the value of that sacrifice like increases in their mind and like drives all kinds of sometimes negative behaviors. You can see this in like narcissistic parents too, where they've like paid a big cost. So it must mean that like there's big value to what I've done. If I quit my job and I gave up my career to raise you, that means that I must have done a very good job. Does that make sense? Like they can't tolerate the idea there's a, a bunch of cognitive dissonance, which is probably the mechanism here, by the way, is like cognitive dissonance, is that we're sort of leveraging cognitive dissonance in a positive way to like get people aligned to move in the direction that they want to go. And in the case of like narcissistic parents, it's kind of the other way around. Where like to prevent that cognitive dissonance, like it feels dumb to like pay a cost and not get value out of it. So as you sort of raise awareness of the cost, you can actually drive positive behavior. Okay. And then the third thing is ambivalence and sort of working through that ambivalence, which sort of drives people in the right direction. Questions about, you know, how to clarify intent or the value of raising awareness of the negative. Yeah, I don't fully understand how the last part, the paradoxical thing might work in a session. So I, I guess my understanding is, okay, so we're going to raise a lot of where, awareness of the negatives, which increases the cost. And therefore, when they actually try it, then it drives the behavior more. Is that what it yeah. is? So, so uh, in session, I think the main thing, like, so the questions that you want to ask is like for a given goal, like what's it going to cost you? Right? Like that's the question you want to ask. Like, what do you have to give up by doing this? So if I start, if I, if the goal is to get me to stop playing like a game all day, what do I give up? What do I lose by not playing the game? Cause that's not something most people think about. What, what most people just think about is like, what do I gain by quitting gaming? And so then what happens is like, they, they're not aware that there's like, like, and then it's kind of silly because like when they try to give up gaming, so let's say that the advantages of gaming is that like, let's just take this example. Okay. So for gaming, what are the advantages if I play video games all day? Like, what do I get from that? Emotional suppression. Absolutely. Uh, fun. Distraction. Socialization. Yep. Socialization. Dopamine. Get some of that sweet, sweet dopamine or fun, right? So, and everyone, what, what, what people tend to look at is like the advantages of achieving a goal. So they think like, oh my God, like I'm going to get money and I'm going to, you know, get healthy and I'm going to become independent and I'm going to be confident, right? This is what they're focusing on. And then when they try to do it, like they're not prepared for like this. So like the, they're not prepared for the shame. They're not prepared for the loneliness and they're not prepared for the boredom. And so if they're not like ready for this, like what's going to happen when they stop playing games for a day? 
Like, this is going to hit. And then, like, their brain is like, this feels bad. Why the hell are we doing this? Let's go back to the gaming. Like, which one do you think your brain is going to pick? I give you a choice. Red pill, blue pill. One involves having fun and having friends. And one involves shame, loneliness, and boredom. Which one are you going to pick? So you have to help people understand that there's a cost. And oddly enough, like, the more that you emphasize cost... So let me ask y'all, like, when you emphasize cost, like, which way are you moving in this quadrant? Away right. from desires. Yeah, away from desires, sure. So I'd say that, like, if we think about cost, right, cost is up here. So, like, this is how you move people in this direction. And then what you do is you help people, like, okay, what do you care about as you clarify that? You know, so this is how you get away from desires. Absolutely. And then you're in the shoulds. And then like, you know, there are other techniques that you can use to move people to the right. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Tom? I think so. So we're trying to highlight the, the cost that it's going to cost a lot in terms of shame, loneliness, boredom. And then for some reason, paradoxically, that actually drives behavior. Yeah. So, so like, uh, you know, we don't want to overemphasize it because chances are they're blind to it. So we want to raise some awareness of it. And then what happens is like, once they know what to expect, right, then we're engaging this circuit, whatever the hell this is. Because then when they try and you say, Hey, like, I think this next week. So if you want to quit gaming, I'm behind you hundred percent. I think it's going to be tough. I know you can do it, bro, but it ain't going to be easy. Right. Does that like, does that make sense in terms of a coach? Like as a coach, like how that will help someone move in the right direction? Yeah, that, that definitely helps to clarify. Right. So like, it's like, Hey bro, this ain't going to be easy or, but like, this is what it could look like. So I want you to be prepared. And then you can also engage a lot of other like super practical stuff since it's going to be so hard. You know, I know you want to stop gaming for a week, but like you may just last one or two days at a time. How are you going to feel if you fail after one or two days? And let's remember that this can take practice, right? So then you're going to prep them from failure. You're going to do all that kind of good stuff. And then when they come in, they say, okay, I was only able to make it three days. And then you can say, hold on a second. On your first attempt, you didn't meet your goal of one week, but you actually went 72 hours without playing a single video game. That's amazing. And you view that as a failure? And you went 72 hours? Like, I can see that you didn't meet your goal, but on the flip side, like, if you did it for one day, if you did it for two days and you did it for three days, like you could probably do it for three days again. Let's figure out how you can do it for three days again. You adjust their goal. We'll kind of get to that in a second. But that's the iterative aspect, right? So it all kind of ties together in a practical sense. We've got, a, you know, a list of questions and exercises, by the way, and like even dialogue, sample dialogue for y'all that we'll give y'all in the manual. Okay? That'll clarify a lot of these things. Okay. So now we get to the fun part. Presuming this hasn't been fun already. Okay, so now what we're going to do is talk about how awareness changes people. So here we are saying, oh, just like have conversations about their shoulds and their values and their desires and have conversations about this and make them aware of the costs. So the question becomes like, how does that from a neuroscience perspective actually result in like changes in their behavior? And this gets really fascinating. So have you all seen the Vidya versus Nyan um, video in Dr. K's guide? And can anyone kind of explain like a TLDR of like what, what the takeaway from that guide is? I think if I remember correctly, Vidya is knowledge and Nyan is understanding. So it's like objective knowledge and subjective understanding and the differences between the two. Yep. So it's information. It's objective. And then Nyan is um, understanding, and it's subjective. So which one do you think is more responsible for behavioral change? Nyan. Absolutely. Right? So this is, once again, the problem of the internet, which is that we have tons of information out there about how to fix your life, right? Available to you for the low price of $300 if you sign up now. But everyone watches these things and like, it doesn't actually change their behavior. And there's new, there's tons of information from like medical science 
that information does not change behavior, right? So if I have someone who's like smoking and I say, hey, if you smoke, you're going to get lung cancer. Do you want lung cancer? They say no. Do they quit smoking? No. Okay. Right. So then the question becomes, how does awareness go from here to here? Like, so this is essentially what we're going to do. We're going to, what we focus on in coaching is not giving them information. We focus on giving them understanding. So how does that process work? So it starts by understanding two things. One is that there's explicit memory and there's implicit memory. Okay. And then there's working memory. We're going to kind of gloss over working memory for a second. So explicit memory is information, facts, and uh, memories. Does this make sense? So like if I ask you, you know, what your name is or where was the, what was the address, like what city did you grow up in? That's like explicit memory. It's stored in a particular part of the brain, like the hippocampus. Okay. And then implicit memory is like, is understanding. So let me give you all an example. And it's stored in other parts of the brain. So let's say I want to learn how to play basketball. So if I want to learn how to play basketball, I go and I watch YouTube videos on basketball. I go and I read books about Michael. I watch the Michael Jordan documentary. I learn all these facts about basketball. I study like the physics of the body and I figure out, I learn all these tips, right? So people say that when you're shooting, you should, you know, when you're shooting hoops, you should follow through. Have y'all heard that before in terms of basketball? So I like, I know all the tips. What happens when I go and play basketball? I have all the information. I'm really inexperienced and not good at making the basket. Absolutely, right? So it doesn't actually translate into like workable information, right? So what happens in the brain is we have these like Infer look, we have these tips. And the cool thing is that we can turn this tip of follow through into understanding. But then what, where that lives is actually the cerebellum for basketball. So what happens is like memories, explicit memories are stored in the hippocampus. But then what happens is that as we catalyze understanding, that information moves from the hippocampus to other parts of our brain. And specifically for us, it moves to the frontal lobe or the neocortex. Okay, so like we can, I can read, I can read about motivation. There are people here who are listening to this on stream right now and they can understand the concepts theoretically and they can even, I can even quiz them, right? Like the next day I can ask chat, chat, what did y'all remember about what I said? But that's all explicit mem memory and it lives in the hippocampus and they can recall it, but it's not actually going to change their lives. In order to change their lives, there's actually a very, in a sense, well-known process where explicit memories from the hippocampus essentially get encoded in other parts of our brain, in the cerebellum, in the frontal lobes, and in parts of our cortices. And once they get encoded there, then they actually affect our behavior, okay? So I'll give you all an example. Like once it clicks for me that I need to follow through when I'm shooting hoops, then my body like kind of responds. But the way that it clicks is how? Like how do I get information to click with shooting hoops? How do I learn how to like, shoot effectively in basketball. Through experience. Absolutely. Practice. I've I got to get a whole bunch of times. Play it, uh, play on the court, right? So I got to get on the court. Okay. So now, and this sort of makes sense, right? Like once I play on the court, like once I practice, once I get out there, once I start fluidly applying the concepts, swimming around in the concepts, I don't quite understand it, right? So like a lot of being on the court is about being at the barrier of your understanding. So let me ask y'all, what is the mental equivalent of get playing on the court? How do we do that? How do we get in there and actually start shooting hoops when it comes to mental concepts like desires By and studying for just 30 minutes or whatever the applicable goal would be? Nope. Incorrect. Studying is explicit information. Oh, sorry. I meant studying in the sense of like, if your goal is like to get a 4.0, but the small insignificant step is studying, then you take I that small insignificant step. Okay, so, but I can't take that small and significant step, step, right, Steve? 
Like that's my whole problem is I can't study. So what's the equivalent? I know it's sort of like a read my mind question, but I'm going to stick to this one. What's the equivalent of playing on the court when it comes to like these mental internal processes? Picking up the ball and shooting hoops. Let's see if chat can get it. It's not doing it. Okay. So I know this is, this is, I love these answers. This is it. This is literally what we do. Right? So like, here's the thing. There's all this theoretical crap floating around in their head. Getting them to play with it. Getting them to understand. I know you guys know this, right? This is literally what you do. You get on the court of the mind. And you help people like understand these concepts. They play around with them. You test it this way. You test it that way. You talk about it. You have revelations. You have emotional catharsis. They're, they're starting to play with these concepts and you're bringing it out with them. That's literally what coaching is. So that's why we do coaching in the way that we do it. So like as someone, you can explain this stuff to people, but as y'all work with them, as you talk about these concepts, these concepts move from information to understanding. They start to move into your frontal lobes and like your neocortex and like other parts of your brain. And then they start to actually affect your behavior. So this is also why, you know, as we look at some of the, the format of coaching, why do we coach people one hour a week over eight weeks as opposed to eight hours in one day? What do y'all think that is? We want them to do the work. Uh, sure. You need practice over time? Absolutely. So this mechanism, when does this happen? Do you all know? This process right here. It happens at a very specific time. When does explicit memory get encoded as implicit memory? When does information... sleeping? Absolutely. During sleep. Okay, so theoretically, and we've tried this, okay, so we've had coaches who will work with clients twice a week. This is also why um, we actually, like, generally speaking, keep the sessions to an hour, because remember, you have this working memory, and so your working memory gets overwritten after 45 minutes. So, like, a lot of times clients will want, like, 90-minute sessions or two-hour sessions because it feels good. But what we really want is we don't want them to lose the first 45 minutes and the next 45 minutes. So a lot of the way that we've structured our intervention is baked, it has some of these concepts baked in. That change happens over time. Like, sure, we sort of generically know that. But hippocampus consolidation into long-term memory and application into your cerebellum happens during sleep. So if you want to study effectively, for example, like when I was studying in medical school, part of the reason I was effective is because I tried to take a nap every day. Because studying for four hours at a stretch is not as effective as studying for two hours taking a nap and studying for two hours. You give your brain time to consolidate that memory and turn it into understanding. Questions about this? Okay, right on time. Finish on time. All right, so let's go ahead and... Um, but just summarize this quickly. So like if we think about basketball, right? It's essentially practice. And so what is practice for the mind? Like that's what we try to do in coaching. So this is where like, as you understand these concepts, as you play with these concepts, as you work with clients over time and you kind of reinforce them, what will happen is like these concepts will start to be internalized by your clients and then they'll start to affect their behavior. Because then, then at that point, it's working from the frontal lobe. Like, I, I don't know if this sort of makes sense, but... If you look at motivation and you think about a should, so like when I ignore the shoulds, those shoulds are coming from explicit memory. It's like I'm sitting down, I'm about to play League of Legends first thing in the morning, which is like 11 a.m. for me. And then this, this thought pops up, this fact pops up in my head. I have a thought that gets generated from explicit memory that says, hey, you should not do this. But it does not actually drive my, my behavior. When you look at people who make behavioral changes, the thought comes from a different place. It doesn't just pop up as a fact or a bit of information that then quickly gets ignored. It comes from a completely different place of their brain. 
And when it comes from the frontal lobe, then it actually results in things like impulse control. It's not a fact that is coming from their hippocampus. It's an actual understanding that results in impulse control from the frontal lobe. Does that make sense to y'all or is that like a bit too abstract? Y'all know what I mean? Like if you examine your own thought process, you'll recognize like, you know, you have some good behaviors. And if you pay attention to where those good behaviors come from or where change comes from in your mind, it's not actually a fact. It's something that's coming from a different part of your brain. It's something that reigns in an impulse and drives your behavior. And that's what the frontal lobe does. As long as it's coming from the hippocampus, as long as it's a piece of information, as long as it's vidya, as long as it's me telling you or your parents telling you, this is bad for you, you should stop doing it, it will not change behavior. It'll just be explicit memory. This is also why parents can tell you a thousand times to do something, but as long as it's floating around, you can remember that they told you to do that, but as long as it's coming from your hippocampus and explicit memory, it's not going to drive behavioral change. And so the mechanism for moving from explicit memory to implicit memory is literally how we have designed this coaching intervention. This is the goal. And that's why we kind of say awareness first, raise awareness, raise awareness, raise awareness, because raising awareness is the process that gets you from here to here. They have to like get it, right? They have to understand it. They have to be aware of it. And by the way, awareness is also what strengthens the frontal lobe. So awareness comes from the frontal lobe as well. So from a neuroscience perspective, it's like boosting the frontal lobe. 